Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So inshallah the topic I've chosen to speak about today is regarding the strength of a muslimah. And um, the reason I've chosen to speak about this topic is, you know, because one of the things we're seeing in these times is that, you know, a lot of sisters, you know, I, I feel that they're feeling very confused about what defines femininity in Islam. And... Um, you know, on the one hand, we have that old, that age-old narrative of the Orientalists who have constantly always told us that, you know, to be a Muslim woman means you're supposed to be, you know, weak and subjected. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, we can't deny that amongst Muslims, there are those who've also, you know, given many Muslim women the idea that to be a good Muslima, you know, basically means that, you know, number one, you put up with however you're treated, and number two, that you then also shouldn't speak about that, you know, as if it's not up, it's not from the way of, you know, a Muslima to, you know, to speak up on issues and to have a voice or opinion, you know, rather, you know, she should just stay silent and not complain or, you know, highlight any issues that she's going through. Um, so this is how we find that, you know, unfortunately, you know, many in the Muslim Ummah, unfortunately, are helping to feed into the, you know, the, the narrative that's you know, playing into the minds of many Muslim women that to be, you know, a good Muslim woman means to be in a position of, you know, passiveness and weakness. And sometimes as a reaction to this, we then see some sisters, you know, turning to other false ideologies, you know, seeking the strength that, you know, seeking the strength that they should actually have found in Islam um, and within the Muslim community in the first place, right? So, unfortunately, you know, instead of finding the strength that they, sh you know, they should have found within Islam and within the Muslim community in the first place, we find that they, they end up, um, as a reaction to their, you know, the way they've been treated and things like this, they end up, you know, turning to other false ideologies. Um, so that's why, dear sisters, it's, you know, important that each and every one of us does take back uh, the true narrative that Allah Ta'ala gave us of what it means to be you know, a Muslim woman. And um, one of the best ways to do this is to simply look at the, all of the examples that Allah Ta'ala gave us of female role models throughout history. You know, because not one of them, there's not one of them, if you look at all of them, you think about them, think about, you know, the Sahab, hab, the Sahabiyat, you know, think about all of the examples Allah gave us. There's not one of them except you see the strength and bravery and unwavering iman that they had. And just to, you know, give you some quick examples, because I know you all of you know many, but you, know, you think about Hajar, you know, radiallahu anha, you know, imagine, you know, being left in the middle of the desert with nothing, subhanAllah. Of course, Allah Ta'ala was doing that for a higher purpose, a purpose that was higher than both herself and Ibrahim and, and Ismail, you know, alayhi salam. Um, but, you know, what is, what is, what is, what's Hajar's reaction to that? What's Hajar's reaction to being left in that absolutely, you know, destitute situation? She says to, you know, when she, you know, she, as Ibrahim is walking away from her, you know, of course, he doesn't want to look back because he knows if he looks at his wife, the emotions will overtake him and he, he knows he has to fulfill this command of Allah Ta'ala. So what does, what does Hajjah say to him? Allahu ladi amaraka bihada ya Ibrahim. Ibrahim is this, you know, is Allah Ta'ala the one who's ordered you to do this, Ibrahim? And all he says is na'am. And so she says, Idan la yudai'una. Then Allah Ta'ala will never cause us to be lost. So just look at the unwavering bravery of, of Hajar, you know, how she faces that destitute situation with absolute bravery and yaqeen. Also, if you think about Asia, you know, when the situation when Fir'aun comes and tells her how he's gone and tortured the, you know, tortured to death the, you know, the um, hairdresser of the royal, you could call her the royal hairdresser, and her five children, he tortured them to death. Why? All because she said, Rabbi Allah. And so we see the reaction of Asya. She, it's, not a, it's not a passive and submissive one. She doesn't you know, react to this news in a passive and submissive way in the face of, you know, when she hears this injustice. Rather, what does she do? You know, she stands up to Fir'aun and she says to him, you know, woe to you. How daring are you and how bold are you in the sight of Allah? Right? And so then because of her reaction, he's so shocked with her reaction. He says, to her, he says to her, you know, it seems that you've gone crazy just like the, you know, just like the hairdresser went crazy as well. And then she tells him straightforward, you know, in a straightforward manner, 
I have not gone, you know, I've, I have not lost my mind. I'm not crazy, but rather, amantu billahi ta'ala. You know, I have believed in Allah, Rabbil Alameen. I have believed in Allah, the Lord of the world. And that's when Fir'aun, you know, orders for her to be tied up and beaten, all because, why? Because she says, Rabbi Allah. So, you know, and subhanAllah, so Allah, and we know, we know the rest of the story. And similar to this also, as you know, Allah Ta'ala, subhanAllah, who did he make the first martyr in Islam? Sumaya. You know, Sumaya, subhanAllah, radiallahu anha. And we know how she's taken out into the hot desert sun and, you know, and subhanAllah, tied up and, and you know, and subhanAllah, impaled until she, you know, subhanAllah, um, radiallahu anha wa radaha, you know, she's impaled to death. So, so we need, that's why my dear sisters, we need to ask ourselves, you know, when you look, when you reflect upon all of these examples, and, and there's so many more, as you know, um, you know, ask yourselves, where are the examples in our Islamic literature of weak women? You know, every single one of these examples are like pillars of, you know, strength, pillars, pillars of uh, bravery and strength. Um, you know, even if you think about Khadija, radiallahu anha, who's the one who was the pillar of strength in supporting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in his moment of vulnerability, you know, in which he feared his own sanity. You know, subhanAllah, like that moment when Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the first time and says, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, you know, read in the name of the Lord who created, you know, created. And, and subhanAllah, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when this happened to him, he didn't actually know what's going on with himself. You know, he was, it was obviously, I mean, imagine such a situation, you know, and he goes back to Khadija radiallahu anha, you know, trembling. He doesn't know what's happening to himself. But who's the one who stands next to him in that moment of vulnerability, you know? And what does Khadija radiallahu anha say? How does she face that situation with complete calmness, you know? And saying, kalla abshir, you know? No. See, seek the good news. For wallahi, for wallahi, la yukhuzik allahu abada. You know, oh, wallahi, Allah, you know, I swear by Allah, Allah will never cause you to be disgraced ever. You know, subhanAllah, you're a person who you you maintain the blood ties. You know, you, you're you honest in your speech and upright in your speech. You support the, the weak and the oppressed. And you, you know, you you're you're generous to the to the guest. You know, subhanAllah. So Allah will, Ta'ala will never cause you to be to be, you know, to be humiliated or to be lost. So, you know, and and subhanAllah too, if you you'll also, you know, reflect upon the many women um, throughout, you know, throughout, especially the times of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, you know, the Khulafa al Rashidin, if you, you know, reflect upon their examples about how they would, you know, speak up, they would ask questions, they would even sometimes openly refute certain statements made by male Sahaba. And no, no, no one would, no one in, in those times would tell her, you know, don't speak like that because you're a woman, for example. Or, you know, no one would, would call her a feminist, for example, for, for asking for her rights in Islam. And an example of this, you know, a good example of this is if you look at what happened during the Khalifa, the time of the Khalifa of Umar radiallahu anhu, when, you know, he was standing on the, um, standing on the minbar, standing on the pulpit, and, you know, he, he gave a talk to the, you know, to the companions and all those who were present, and he wanted to restrict the amount of mahar because he found people going to excesses in the amount of dowry they were giving to the women. And, you know, and he wanted to put a restriction on this because it was getting out of control. And uh, so, subhanAllah, when he left the minbar, one of the women, you know, she came up to him and she said to him, Ya Ramil Mu'mineen, you know, O leader of the believers, haven't you heard that Allah Ta'ala sent down in the Quran, And if you had given one of them a qintar in an amount of gold, then don't take any of that back. And, you know, she said, and, and, and Al-Qintar, you know, Al-Qintar is a very large amount, is a very large amount of gold. And so, subhanAllah, when, when this woman spoke up, you know, and said this to Allah, radiallahu anhu, his reaction, as is reported in some narrations, is that he said, you know, verily, verily, a woman has arrived at the truth while Omar has erred. You know, Omar has made a mistake, subhanAllah. So this is the humbleness we see in the Sahaba, you know, like it, it's never about gender, it's, it's about the truth. That's what we should be concerned about and be focused upon. So sisters, it's, it's from looking at, you know, the examples that Allah Ta'ala gave us, you know, looking at all these examples that we learn, you know, the true meaning of femininity in Islam and, you know, what defines the personality of a Muslimah. 
And like I said, you know, there's not one example that Allah Ta'ala has given us of a believing woman, except you find she was like a pillar of strength and yaqeen, subhanAllah. So, you know, for us to properly understand the meaning of being a, a strong Muslimah, the, it, you know, it's very important. I just want to, before I go on, you know, I want to also say that for us to, you know, properly understand the meaning of being a, a strong Muslimah, it's important we also understand what being strong isn't, okay? Because sometimes when we go through certain things, we might, you know, go back in the, in the opposite direction of what, you know, what being strong isn't. So it's important we understand what being strong isn't so that we don't fall in any, into any type of extreme. So, like, number one, what we can say is, you know, being strong does not mean we have to adopt, for example, aggressive feminism, feminism for example, right? Um, and the way we could define this is we see the reaction of, of some, you know, that where you basically reject any need of men, you know, um, where you have beliefs where all men are basically framed as being almost like our enemies and being part of the patriarchy, you know, um, so we have to realize that, you know, in Islam, you know, men and women are not supposed to be enemies to each other. Like Allah Ta'ala created both men and women to complement one another. And, you know, one of the things that Allah Ta'ala tells us is that, you know, the way we're supposed to look at men, you know, our perception of men is that, you know, men are our allies. They are allies who, you know, they back us up, they support us. And so just as we work to support them, like we, need to, we would need to work hand in hand. It's very clear in our teachings, you know, in both the Quran and Sunnah, but, you know, look at the ayah in the Quran where Allah Ta'ala says, wal mu'minuna wal mu'minatu ba'duhum awliya ba'd. You know, like that the believing men and the believing women, they are awliya to each other. They're helpers and supporters of each other. So we cannot be successful. You know, we're not going to be successful in, you know, overcoming our difficulties, overcoming our problems, in our ummah until we learn to work together. We can't be working against each other. And, you know, I need to, it's very important that we do acknowledge that many sisters have had bad experiences, you know, um, sometimes even traumatic experiences with men, unfortunately. And, you know, but what I want to say here is that it's very important that we don't allow those bad experiences to cause us to then fall into like a type of, you could call it victim mentality where, we basically blame all men for what we've suffered, right? So if you look at what the Prophet ﷺ told us, you know, he told us that, there's, that there will always be those who uphold justice in this ummah, right? There's always going to be those who uphold the truth and uphold justice in this ummah, like uh, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, لا تزالوا طائفة من أمتي على الحق That there'll always remain a group from amongst my ummah upon the truth. Okay, so that's why, my dear sisters, you know, in particular, I'm talking to you, you know, we shouldn't lose hope. We should not lose hope and think that, you know, there's no good men out there anymore. Like, I do hear that a lot, where people say there's no good men out there anymore. You know, the reality is the Prophet ﷺ has told us there's always going to be, you know, amongst this ummah, those men in this ummah who genuinely care and respect and stand up for the rights of women. Okay, so... You know, we've got to, it, it, it comes down to, like I said, that we've got to realize that the only way we're ever going to be able to solve all these problems that's happening in our homes and outside our homes, you know, the issues that we're having, we're not going to be able to solve these until we learn to work together with our men and, you know, not against them. It's, it's very important. So another thing here too I wanted to mention is that, you know, being strong does not mean that you need to also make you know, men as our standard of what represents strength. Okay, so what does that mean? You know, basically, why do we have to act and behave like men and think that that's the only way that we can be strong, right? And if you look at what, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, he showed us that, you know, that for men to imitate women and for women to imitate men, this is something that's denounced. It's something denounced in Islam um, you know, basically we can say that gender is something clearly defined in Islam. And so whatever is, we can, the way I can, you know, explain this is that, you know, whatever is considered to be like an exclusive trait of the way that men behave, then women should not, not women should not be, you know, trying to imitate that. And just as men should not, you know, imitate women in their exclusive traits either, right? So how does that translate, you know, to think that you need to lose your femininity 
in order to be seen as strong. You know, why do we have to lose our femininity in order to be seen as strong? Okay, so like subhanAllah, and going back to those examples I gave you before, we just looked at all these very feminine examples of strength. So, you know, if you think about that strength, you know, and think about, for example, the strength of Aisha, think about the strength of Khadija, radiallahu anhuma, you know, they didn't need to go, act, they didn't need to go around acting like I'm not even Khutab in order for them to be, you know, respected and taken seriously. All right. So, like I said, the key is not for us to, you know, take our men as our, you know, take men as our standard of what it needs to be strong. Rather, all we need to do is basically search within, within our own gender to find those examples of true strength. And inshallah, at the end of my talk, I'm, I'm actually going to go through some, you know, practical tips on how we can, you know, strengthen ourselves, inshallah. All right, another, another point too that I wanted to mention is that, you know, being strong does not being does not actually mean being aggressive in general i mean and this is for men and women both it's not just for not just for women you know and we see that the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which he says laysa shadidu bisura you know like that the shadid the strong person is not the one who get lets himself get angry quickly right and 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 he tries to show you know his wrestling through his anger and things like that and becoming aggressive through his anger but in the shadidu ladi yamliku nafsa like the, the shadid, the, uh, sorry, the, the strong one, yani the strong person in, is in fact the one who's able to, um, they're able to control themselves in the ghadab. They're able to control themselves when they get angry, right? So, you know, in fact, uh, I'm going to talk about that in a while too, you know, being assertive is far stronger than being like an aggressive person, okay? So there's no need for a person, you know, you don't show, you don't show your strength through swearing you don't show your strength through being rude to others you don't show your strength you show your strength through you know oppressing others that's not the way to show strength that's not strength okay so this is where we have to make sure we don't fall into things that go to the opposite of what strength means um another thing as well is you know um being strong does not mean acting opposite to al haya, right and it's important for us to define al-hayat because some people think al-hayat is just, you know, putting on hijab. It's, you know, they think that's al-hayat. But, you know, what is al-hayat? Basically, it is a type of khuluq. It's a, it's a mannerism that, you know, prevents a person from basically saying or doing anything that's, like, considered to be vulgar or not a befitting of the personality of a believer. All right? That's what's al-hayat. That's how we define al-hayat. And this is exactly why the Prophet wasallam said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي like if you don't like because if a person doesn't even feel embarrassed in front of Allah and they don't even feel embarrassed in front of the people, then do whatever you want because basically you've lost your self-respect. Okay, you've lost your self-respect. So having an haya is about respecting yourself and through respecting yourself, others respect you through that. Okay, but you know, when, you know, so we have to understand that, you know, being strong does not mean you act you start acting in a way where you lose your haya, you lose your that dignity, you lose that respectability. Okay. Um, and sometimes, and here we we should mention, I'll give you some examples to, to sort of clarify this more. You know, sometimes we'll find that, you know, obviously, you know, obviously Khadija radiallahu anha, for example, she was a huge example to us, you know, of of a of a powerful and strong woman, right? There's no doubt that she was a strong woman. And you know, she was a businesswoman, all those things. But it's, it's important that we don't then, you know, unfortunately some people do this, where they, they basically wrongly um, use her example to support what they're doing, which is actually going outside the bounds of Sharia, right? So, for example, they might say, you know, like, you know, they're mixing with men without placing appropriate boundaries, without acting in a refined manner and a dignified manner and things like that, right? And you can't use Khadija, radiallahu anha, to support that type of, like, behavior that is you know basically taking you out without outside the bounds of sharia because if you look at the, the reality is that you know Khadija radiallahu anha was only ever known to have the highest level of respectability and virtue in her way of interacting with the opposite gender okay so and that that was even before islam subhanallah so it's important that we don't start to confuse you know these these issues and 
you know, if you look at what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also told us, he said, Al-Hayya wal Iman Qurana Jami'an, right? So that al hayya and an Iman, both modesty and Iman, they are companions to each other. فَإِذَا رَفَعَ أَحَدُهُمَا رَفَعَ الْآخَرِ Like, if one of them is raised, the other is raised. Now, what I mean by that is when someone practices al hayya okay, when they practice al hayya they stay away from everything that is considered to be not the fitting of a believer in the way you speak, in the way that you, you know, behave, in the way you, you know, the things you do, then you'll find your iman will go up. You'll be protected from a lot of sins by that as well, right? And similarly, if we act the opposite of that, you'll find the iman will go down too because you'll end up going into doubtful matters. You'll end up going into, um, you know, saying things which, you know, can end up taking you into the haram or, you know, actions which are haram. So um, that's what we need to keep in mind as well. Now, I'm not... On the other side, okay, there's another extreme of, as well, which is unfortunately very uh, widespread in the Muslim community. And that is that, you know, a lot of women, unfortunately, they think that, you know, being strong uh, means basically staying in a relationship that jeopardizes your spiritual connection to Allah, right? Um, and infor- unfortunately, you see, we look, we see a lot of cases where women are staying in relationships where, Basically, their their spiritual connection to Allah is completely jeopardized. They can't even pray anymore because they're so like they're so distant from Allah through the, what they're going through. Um, in, some of them are placing their lives in danger, their mental state in danger. So, you know, unfortunately, we do see a lot of cases of domestic violence. I don't know how the case is around the world, but here in Australia, you know, working on the ground, um, we have a lot of these cases, and a lot of women um, they they keep on sort of staying within these relationships, which they like they can't even they don't even it's like they're so distant from Allah they don't even know how to half the time pray that's how 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 desperate the situation has become and obviously we can we you know we know that in you know from the maqasid al-sharia that you know we have to place our deen first our deen has to always come first no matter what um so we have to realize that that's not being strong being strong is not just you know placing your 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 deen at risk placing your life at risk your mental state these things right and I'm talking about genuine cases here, not just um, people making that as an excuse, right? So, um, and then the other thing too that a lot of women fall into as well is like, you know, being strong does not mean letting people, you know, walk all over your self-esteem um, and to dis- disrespect and take advantage of you. And then you say, well, you know, I'm being patient and I'm being strong by just putting up with that, right? So that's that's actually not strong, you know? So strength you know, just to understand what is strength, you know, strength is, you know, basically what our, you know, what our dean teaches us is, you know, you need to learn to take action to do whatever is in your power, you know, to change your situation for the better. If we look at Hajar, radiallahu anha, you know, she didn't just sit there and give in to her circumstances, right? She gave it all she had to, you know, try to change her situation for the better, while, of course, having full tawakkul and, and you know, trust and and, and yaqeen in Allah Ta'ala, right? So it's important that we learn that we need to take control of our situation and, and try to look for the ways that we can bring about better change for ourselves and, you know, and not just give in to situations and, and think that, that it's being strong by doing so because we, we put a lot of people at risk, including, including ourselves. Um, so always realise that, you know, even if it's just one small step that you can take towards change, um, to you know, bring about positive change and improve your situation, then you should look into that. You know, whether it's going to a psychologist, going to a counselor, reaching out and getting that emotional support you need to um, strengthen yourself, inshallah, in your situation. Okay, so um, I want to just go back to talking about you know we need so looking at all those different extremes, those different extremes of what a lot of people kind of get into in regards to what they think is being a strong, you know, being strong. Um, we need to realize that Islam gives us the balance, right? Islam is what gives us the balance between these different extremes that we see happening, in, you know, among sisters. And that's exactly why, you know, Islam is known as Deen al wasatiya right? Islam is known as the religion of moderation. Well, i'tidal, you know, the religion of moderation, the religion of balance. So whenever you see extremes going on, know that Islam is somewhere in the middle. It's never this way and it's never that way. It's somewhere smack in the middle and you've got to look for that moderate you've got to look for that moderate path always okay so let's define how what is this you know what is the strong muslima you know let's define that like 
you know, what does it mean? You know, you're strong in your hayat. You're strong in your modesty. You're strong in your dignity and your respectability. You know, you're holding, you know, you hold strong and tightly onto your Islamic principles. You hold firmly onto your, you know, Islamic manners and morals. You know, you're not, you're, you're, you know, you're strong in not giving into your naps, right? You're strong in not giving into your naps. You're, you know, you're strong in not following your desires and, and, and or following the crowd and being a people pleaser, right? That's not strength, right? Um, another thing, you know, you're strong in raising your voice, in enjoying the, the you know, enjoying the, the good and forbidding the evil and, and step, you know, speaking up against injustice and, impression and, and oppression, okay? That's women as well, right? And this is the type of strength that we need to revive in the, the women of our ummah, right? We need to revive this particular strength in in the women of our ummah. Like, if you look at what Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, Surah Tawbah, Allah Ta'ala says, wal mu'minuna wal mu'minatu ba'aduhum awliya'u ba'ad. Like I read before, right? But the, when, what does he say? So, the believing men and the believing women, they are awliya to each other. They're protectors and supporters of each other, right? But with them, what? What's their job? يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Right? That they enjoin al-ma'roof. They enjoin whatever is good, whatever is justice, okay, whatever is the haq, whatever is the truth. وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And they forbid whatever is, you know, uh, whatever is, you know, considered to be against what Allah and His Messenger came with. Whatever is uh, considered to be injustice. You know, anything like anything that goes against what the Sharia came with and the, the, the you know, what the purpose is, the main purpose of Sharia, you know, like the goals of Sharia, then we need to be working together to, to you know, denounce these things and speak up about them together, right? So if we look at what Allah, you know, shows us in this ayah, he's showing us that he wants all of us to be strong in standing up for the truth and in joining it together, not just one and, or, and leaving the other one silent and passive, right? So, you know, it's very clear that Allah Ta'ala, you know, never said that it was only for men, okay? Allah Ta'ala does not want, the reality is that Allah Ta'ala does not want for any of us except to be strong, okay? He wants us all to be strong. Why? Because think about Allah's, from Allah Ta'ala's beautiful names and attributes, He's Al-Qawi, right? Allah Ta'ala is Al-Qawi and He loves the mu'min who is Qawi. Allah loves the mu'min who is strong. Yani, she's qawiyah, right? But of course, in the Islamic def definition of that, not like I told you before, right? So if you look what the Prophet وسلم, said, he tells us, Al-Mu'min al-Qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ila Allahi min al-Mu'min al-Da'if. So that the, the strong Mu'min is more better and more loved to Allah Ta'ala than the weak Mu'min. Like, even though there's khayr in, in both, of course, there's khayr, there's goodness in both, but Allah loves the strong. All right, so this is, I'm already defined to you what the image of what is the strong mu'mina or the strong Muslim, inshallah. May Allah help us all to be there because none of us are strong, my dear sisters, without the help of Allah. And that's what we're going to now talk about. I'm going to give you some uh, tips, inshallah, on how we can try to strengthen ourselves. You know, look, I'll be honest with you, I don't usually do these live talks, okay? I, I, I don't know, this is, a, I don't know, for some reason I, I, I'm very happy and comfortable speaking in front of a public audience. But when it comes to doing live talks like this, I just feel like I don't know who's out there, who's listening to me. And But I said to myself, if I'm going to be talking about a strong Muslimah, I need to try to <laughs> step up and be that, be like that. Yani I can't, you know, what does Allah say? You know, like, why do you say what you don't do? So I thought if I'm going to talk about this, I need to actually implement this myself, right? So, <laughs> alhamdulillah. Anyway, but let me um, go back to how we can, you know, build our inner strength. All right, obviously there's so much to mention here. We, we, we probably could take days talking about this, but I'm just going to try to mention a few really vital point, points that can help you. So number one, don't expect to be strong if you're not seeking it from Al-Qawi Al-Aziz, right? If you want to be strong, don't expect to be strong if you're not seeking that strength from Al-Qawi, from the most strong, Al-Aziz, the most mighty, right? Don't expect to be strong and have strong yaqeen and strong certainty and tawakkul in Allah if you're not constantly focused each day on maintaining your connection to Allah Azza wa Okay, we, that's the number one. You have to be firmly ground, right? And you have to be working on that always. It's not something like, oh, I can just work on it in Ramadan or work on my connection with Allah in Ramadan, but the rest of the year, I just let everything fall apart. 
okay? So obviously there's so much here, but Yanni, number one, number one is the prayers, okay? How on earth would we expect our foundation in Al-Islam to be strong if we're not, we're, you know, we're not focused on our prayers? Because imagine the Messenger of Allah even told us that what are the prayers? What do they represent? Amud al-Din. They are Amud al-Islam, right? So the prayers are actually the foundation of our whole religion, okay? So, and the way I usually, do, you know, describe this to sisters, I, I say to them, if you were to build a house, okay, and you don't make the foundation firm, no matter how beautiful that house is up the top, it all, all it's going to take is for one big gust of wind to come and the whole thing's going to fall apart. Why? Because you didn't make your foundation strong. So don't expect to be to have that strength like Khadija, like Aisha, like, like you know, um, Hajar, right? When you're not, like, focusing on cons being constant in your prayers, you know, praying your prayers on time and being diligent about that because that, you know, you won't gain the strength without being close to Allah, right? So that's number one. And, and, and you know, so I, I, I say to sisters, if, if you don't feel strong for some particular reason, if you're, not, if you're feeling a bit vulnerable in, you know, practicing your religion or whatever that is, um, have a look at your prayers, see how, how much you're trying to, you know, be careful with praying your prayers on time because it, it makes a huge difference, okay? The second thing, obviously, as well, is doing a lot of dhikr of Allah and, and doing your adhkar, you know, in the morning and the evening is very important. Like, it really does strengthen you. I mean, look, what do you get out of constantly remembering Allah? You're realigning your purpose always, right? You're realigning your mind to be thinking about what is the, what is the most important thing I should be working towards, right? Okay, working towards Allah and the Akhirah, that is my number one goal I should be always worried about, right? And, and that's what gives you the strength. When you know that that's your goal, that help, helps you to overcome a lot of, a lot of you know, obstacles that, you know, can, can come in your mind and make you have all this, like, waswasa, you know, um, negative thoughts that you think that you can't overcome your situation, okay? And uh, if you look at what Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimallah, said about uh, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimallah, you know, he was so amazed by his teacher, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. Like, he couldn't believe, like, how this, this scholar was able to, the amount of books he was able to read, the things he was able to write, you know, how he would be able to sit for hours, giving, you know, uh, you know giving his fatawa, teaching the ummah, all of these things. Um, he was just amazed with it, you know, subhanAllah. But the interesting thing is, look at what Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah used to pay attention to, right? In the morning, after Fajr, he used to take that time out to, you know, do his dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. He would sit there and remember Allah. In fact, it's mentioned he would, would remember Allah for a, lo for a long time in the morning, okay? And then if he was asked, why do you do that? He would say, هَذِهِ غَضَوْتِي You know, like, this is my, like my nourishment. This is like my, my, my fuel or my nourishment. And if I don't nourish myself, if I don't take هَذِ الْغَدَاءِ If I don't take this uh, nourishment, لَسَقَثَتْ like, you know, my, my, my strength would, would go because where's my strength ultimately from? My strength is ultimately from Allah Azza wa So with Allah, you can do amazing things that you wouldn't be able to do by yourself, subhanAllah. So this is something to keep in mind that you want to be, be strong and you want to be able to overcome your obstacles. You need to turn to Allah and gain that strength from Him. And then the other thing which we have to mention in this, this part, you know, is you've got to be also close to the Quran. Why did Allah send the Quran, my dear sisters and brothers, you know, for us to be strong, it's, it's a tool to use in this life. Like, don't you think Allah knew there's going to be so many, we're going to be tried with so many different tests and tribulations. But Allah gave us those things to help us overcome those things and to be strong in the face of all of that, right? And you look at what Allah Ta'ala said to Yahya. Ya Yahya, khudil kitaba bi quwa. Hold on to the revelation with quwa. Hold on to it with strength. Because when you do that, when you hold on to the revelation, both in the way you pay attention to reciting it, memorizing it, and especially acting upon it, that's what gives you the strength. You get the strength from Allah Ta'ala through that, okay? So moving on, so like I said, the first thing to pay attention to is realize that you can't be strong unless you're with Allah. Allah is, what, Allah is the one who gives you the strength, right? But then secondly, the other thing too is learn to live to please Allah alone. Right? Learn to live to please Allah alone. And this has to be, honestly, one of the most empowering principles to live by. If you can understand this and start to apply it in your life, you'll see how powerful this principle is. Because, look, 
it frees you from the feeling of, of, of needing to be a people pleaser, okay? It frees you from the feeling of a lot of guilt. Like a lot of people feel guilt, you know, look, I did all that for her and she's not happy. And But if you know that, look, you did that for Allah, you did the best, and as long as you know you've done your best, then, it, you know, you, at the end of the day, you can never please everybody. Not everybody's going to be happy with you, no matter what you do. But as long as you know you did that for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, then that's what gives you peace of heart and mind, right? So you learning to live to please Allah alone, this helps you to live in a way that you don't have to worry. You become freed. You basically become freed from the imprisonment of worrying about the opinions of others, okay? So, and this leads me to talk about, you know, one of the things we're seeing, unfortunately, in these times is that a lot of people, you know, we see them, like, going into, like, compromising their Islamic values, you know, maybe even compromising practicing their deen. And what is the reason behind it? Because, for example, when some money comes up or a chance to, you know, get more fame or, you know, other things, all the temptations of this dunya, right, um, then unfortunately you'll find them, you know, letting go of, of, of their principles, letting go of their, their practices of the deen, um, you know, seeking you know, seeking to please others or seeking to, to get that gain in dunya, right? So, you know, we've got to remind ourselves that it might seem like they're getting ahead. Like some people might look at them and think, wow, they're really getting ahead in what they're doing, right? But you have to realise that as long, let me tell you something, sisters, I and brothers, if you're out there, let me tell you that over and over again, what I have seen is that, you know, whenever a person, and may Allah protect us, none of us are perfect, right? Absolutely not. But the reality is that every time you choose dunya, and pleasing people, over-pleasing Allah, you'll find that it, it will ultimately be something that weakens you, right? It's ultimately going to be something that weakens you. Ultimately, as well, you'll find that it, in fact, will, will, will cause you to lose respect of people in the end as well, okay? And what is the reason for that? What is the reason for that? Because, because number one, it weakens you spiritually, right? If you're um, going into what Allah is not pleased with, you're weakened spiritually by that. And the other thing is that Allah leaves you. You don't have the help of Allah anymore, right? And you can see this. It's mentioned in a hadith, um, narrated in Ibn Hibban and At-Tirmidhi. It's uh, mentioned by uh, Aisha, radiallahu anha, in which she said that man il tamasa ridan nas, whoever goes seeking the, you know, the pleasure of the people, bi um, you know, whoever goes seeking the, the pleasure of people while they're displeasing Allah, in fact, Allah will end up being displeased with them. And he'll cause the people to be displeased with them ultimately, right? And the other part of the hadith says, and whoever seeks to please Allah, even though people are not pleased with them, people might not be pleased with what you're doing or what you're saying. But as long as you're doing that sincerely for the sake of Allah, according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, Allah will be pleased with you and eventually he'll cause people to be pleased with you. So once you know this principle, this is a very empowering principle. And this is why I always say too that, you know, many times are going to come up in your life where Allah is going to test you to choose. Who do you love more? You know, who do you love more? And, you know, basically, and this is why we need to be saying to ourselves each time, when if you want to think about how to be successful in this life and the next, right? We don't want to be successful in this life at the expense of the next. Okay, so if you want to be successful in this life, you need, and in the next as well, you need to be asking yourself, is what I'm saying pleasing to Allah? Is what I'm doing pleasing to Allah? Or am I just saying that and, you know, or doing that just to make people happy with me? If that's the only reason, right? So, you know, finishing up on this point, you know, learn to live your truth. You know, it, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. Sometimes your voice is going to shake. But you've got to realize that all strength, all izzah, all strength, all honor is with Allah Ta'ala alone. And that's why we've, we've got to keep on turning back to that. The next thing I want to mention as well in how to be a strong Muslim, inshallah, may Allah help us all to be that one, be idnillah. And that is, you've got it, knowledge is, is, is very, very important. Okay? When I talk about knowledge, knowledge of Allah, know who, know, is, know who is Allah, right? Knowledge of Allah's names and attributes, knowledge of your deen. You know, knowledge of your rights in Islam as well as a Muslim, right? So knowledge is one of the greatest forms of empowerment. Um, if, you know, especially if you want to be strong in your identity as a Muslim, okay? If you want to feel confident 
in raising your voice against injustice and oppression, you need to have strong knowledge to start off with. You want to do all these things, like a lot of people want to do all these things. How much have you worked on, you know, strengthening your knowledge base to start off with? Okay. Now, I want to give an example here. Look at Aisha, radiallahu anha. You know, ask yourself, what was it that gave her the leverage to be able to have the com confidence to speak up for the truth and not worry about what other people thought about her? Okay. It was her knowledge. And, you know, so many times you'll see how Aisha, radiallahu anha, would, you know, fearlessly correct statements said by even some of the heads of Sahaba, right? Like there was a time, I love this, I love this narration, you know, where, where Aisha, radiallahu anha, she heard Abdullah ibn Umar telling women that when they don't go to take horse after Janaba, like after being intimate with their husbands, that they have to undo all their braids because they used to, you know, they used to braid their hair, many tight braids. Um, and so he was telling them that they have to undo all their braids every single time they take wolves, uh, you know, from a, Jan a Janaba. And so what does she say? She says, this is very strange on the part of Ibn Omar. You know, he's telling women to undo their braids when they do a wolves. Why doesn't he just go tell them to shave their heads? And then she says, she gives the proof. She said, verily, the Prophet said, and I used to take wolves in one vessel, and I never did more than pour water over my head three times, right? And this hadith is in Muslim, okay? So see here, you know, because she's got the knowledge, no one can push her around, and she feels confident to speak up against injustice. And this is the problem a lot of sisters have. They don't, you don't know your rights to start off with, so you're not able to stand up for yourself, okay? So it's very important. Um, and this is what we find, unfortunately, a lot of women found themselves in these disempowering situations. What is the reason? Because they don't have knowledge. And Realize, my dear sisters, and of course, brothers too, you know, when you don't have the knowledge, it's so easy for people to take advantage of you and push you into accepting, you know, situations that you should never have to accept. Like over the years, I can't even tell you how many re reverts I saw, you know, unfortunately, you know, because of they're always the ones in general taking advantage of in particular. What, what is the reason? She's a target because she doesn't have the knowledge to start off with. So she, unfortunately, she becomes a target for people to, you know, take advantage of her. And, you know, if we look at the state of our, of our women in this ummah, okay, what is one of the reasons why there is a lot of, we, we do find a lot of um, disempowerment amongst our sisters because, unfortunately, for many hundreds of years, they were shut out of the masajid, you know, like they didn't get the chance to learn about their, you know, learn the knowledge of their deen and to, you know, that some places, as we know, in some places in the world, there's not even a place for them to come. And I'm not talking about just in one mosque. I'm talking about in all the mosques, okay? Of course, we understand that not every masjid may be able to provide a place, but when we're talking about every single masjid, you know what I mean? Then this, this is a problem. And then we find, why do we find our sisters having such a lack of knowledge? And they are the ones, you know, raising the next generation. And yet, subhanAllah, um, you know, and if, if women don't have that knowledge, then like I said, it's so easy for them to be taken advantage of. The, the man, you know, her husband can just, or anyone in her family can just basically tell you, just do this, you know, and, and she just readily accepts because she's scared of Allah. She, you know, she wants to do the right thing. And unfortunately, they get manipulated into doing things that they would never have, had, have accepted had they had the knowledge, you know, that leverage to know that, no, this is not right. I shouldn't accept this. Allah gave me this right. And the message of Allah, so Allah told me this. Okay, sisters, that's very important. But the fourth point that I want to mention as well is, um, you know, you, ne you need to also know your self-worth. It's very important. You need to work on your self-esteem because, like, you could have the knowledge and, you know, and all of these things. You're trying really hard. You say, well, I pray five times a day. I do everything. But for some reason, I don't feel confident, you know. So often it's because you need to work on your self-esteem. You, you need to know your self-worth. Like, unfortunately, we all know that a lot of sisters just self-hate. They hate themselves. They can't even – I've known some poor sisters that if I was to ask them – Tell me something good about yourself. She said, there's nothing good about me. Okay, so this is something very worrying when someone can't even tell you one good thing about themselves. I mean, the fact that Allah chose you to be a Muslima, there must be so many great virtues in you. Okay, and I just want to mention that, you know, one of the things that I learned from Aisha, she was not afraid to mention her self-worth. Okay, of course, not talking about, we're not talking about being arrogant. Okay, we, we shouldn't go into arrogance. But, like, sometimes a, there are times and places where you need to be able, someone, especially when someone's putting you down, you need to be able to state your worth and not let people tread on your, tread on your dignity. Okay? So, like, we know sometimes with Aisha, 
she would, you know, she would say, she wasn't afraid to say, you know, you know, all of you other wives, your family is married you to the Prophet but Allah is the one who married me to the Prophet you know, and the Quran, Allah chose, uh, Allah Ta'ala chose my house for the Quran to be re revealed in it, you know. So she would mention these type of things. To, you know, I learned that from her, subhanAllah. So this is, we, we have to try to implement this for ourselves. Another thing is to learn how to become assertive. This is very empowering for women and for anyone, in fact, not just women, anyone, who, especially if you've been a person who's gone through some type of impression, oppression in your life. Um, learn to be, become more assertive. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean being aggressive, like we already spoke about, strength is not aggressiveness, okay? So a lot of women have trouble in navigating this. Like you'll find when you're younger, you tend to be a lot more passive. You tend to be, you know, just keep, you know, I'm being patient. You don't say anything. You, a lot of things are going on. People are treating your dignity. You just be quiet, be quiet. I'm doing this for Allah, you say to yourself. But then one day you can't take it anymore and then she goes the opposite direction. She ends up becoming totally aggressive, taking out everybody, you know. <laughs> so um, it is important to go and read up you know, sisters, about how to be assertive. It's a, like a middle ground. It's about stating how you feel. You know, you're allowed to have feelings. You're allowed to not be happy with things that don't make you feel good. And to be able to state that confidently, but not in aggressive way, but like to be heard. You know, you have a right to be heard, right? So um, like I said, it's important that you you go and read about that because it, it takes probably can inshallah have a session on that <laughs> with the sisters, you know, to explain about it. But you know, it does take practice as well. Like you can read about it, but then it's going to take practice to build that up. Like it's not easy in the beginning because you're so used to not speaking up for what how you feel. And, you know, but an example, I'll just give you a quick example. Like to say, you know, look, I understand that you might have meant that. However, I felt like I just want to let you know that I did feel, you know, upset when that happened. You know, for example, you know, so you acknowledge the other person, you try to give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they didn't do that on purpose and they didn't mean to hurt your feelings. However, when they did that to you, it made you feel sad. It made you feel like maybe worthless when you said something like that to me. It's important to be able to convey your feelings and, and how you feel. Um, and one thing that does help too is uh, look for assertive people around you. You'll find that there are some people who are like some women are able to confidently like sort of state how they feel when they when they feel like someone's trodden on their their um you know trodden on their dignity and put them down in some way you'll find that they will follow that up they'll let the person know like not be not be like um not be like passive passive aggressive where instead of going and talking to the person openly about that you go behind their back and start gossiping about them backbiting them because you know you're so upset about what they've done but you don't have you know, say you don't do something about it so you know, being assertive is about taking control of the situations. Uh, another thing as well, uh, this is like my second last point, inshallah, and that is learn how to take responsibility for your own life. It's very important that sisters learn how to do this. Like, you know, we need to stop the blame my circumstances game and, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves mentality. Like we do fall into this a lot. And, uh, and this can be on the home front, you know, in our houses, but even... Even in the Ummah as well, it plays into that as well because, like, we can just sit here and feel sorry for ourselves as women, you know, oh, look at us, you know, all these things are happening to us in the world. And But what are we doing about it, sisters? You understand? So we need to take proactive measures to change our situation for the better and not just, like, get in that victim mentality, whether, as I said, on the home front or in the wider Ummah front, okay? And one of my favourite um, hadith, you know, one of my favourite uh, hadiths from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us how to be that mu'min qawi. He tells us exactly how to be that strong Muslim, how to be that strong believer, right? Al mu'min al qawi khayrun wa ahabu ila Allahi min al mu'min al dhaif. I already told you that part of the hadith before, that the strong mu'min is better and more loved to Allah than the weak mu'min, even though both this khayr in both, right? But what does he tell us to do? Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Like, focus on what benefits you, right? وَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْجَزْ And seek the hope of Allah and don't despair and don't give up hope. And don't just give up. Keep going. Keep going with your efforts, right? وَإِنْ أَصَابَكَ الشَّيْءِ فَلَا تَقُولْ لَوْ أَنِّي فَعَلْتُ كَانَ كَذَا وَكَذَا Like if something goes wrong and things don't work out the way you were hoping, don't sit there and say, oh, if only I did that or if only I did that, you know, um, then, it, you know, this would, it would have been like this. It would have been better. Right? Or it wouldn't have worked out like that. But what you should say instead is say, What Allah destined, what He willed to happen, happened. 
and what yani and and what he destined to happen happened this is what we need to be saying because there's no use because once you start you know once you start saying if only i did that or if only that happened or you know and you beat yourself up, you beat yourself up about it what does it do as the messenger of allah told us but in the law this word law this word if only taftahu amana shaytan it opens up the doors of shaytan it opens up the the you know you open the door for shaytan to come whisper to you uh look at you know and you start regretting and you start having anxiety and all of these things pan allah so like look the bottom line is you know we need to be proactive like our is- islam teaches us to be proactive no matter how impossible the circumstances may be you do whatever is in your power and i find it amazing that you know allah taala chose maryam alayhi salam when she's in her ultimate situation of like you know helplessness you know what does he tell her wa huzzi ilayki bi jid nakhla like go you know go to the nakhla like go, go to the nakhla even though she's heavily in, you know in labor and all these things in absolute helplessness but he tells her go and shake the palm tree even though it takes 10 men 10 strong men couldn't even shake a palm tree right but he tells her go shake the palm tree in order for the the dates the right dates or the provision to be falling down and Allah you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help will come to you but you're taking that small action even though it might seem hopeless and almost impossible for that help to come to you at that moment so we learn from her story that to take the action no matter how small it is not you know don't feel hopeless just keep on going and seeking the help of Allah right so the last thing is know with certainty know with your heart and mind that la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah there is no you know there is no power and there is no strength except with Allah taala so none of us can be truly strong without the help of Allah and you know what brings weakness is depending on others and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us man ta'allaqa shay'an wukila ilayhi whoever puts their whole you know dependence into something you'll be left to that allah will leave you to that so that's why you know we shouldn't just only depend on our own efforts we need to always you know of course you need to do something yourself but you need to ultimately first and foremost put your dependence upon allah to achieve all of your aims all right so and if you look at musa alayhi salam as strong as musa was and he's a prophet and messenger as strong as he was but what is what does he what does he say rabbi shrah li sadri You know he turns to Allah and says ya Allah open up my chest wa yassir li amri make my make my affair easy for me subhanallah so I'll wrap it up inshallah for today but I just want to wrap up by saying you know that you know the reality is that let's say this that the muslim woman who is connected to Allah she is the strongest woman on earth and we should be the strongest women on earth right if we had that true connection with Allah we can be the strongest women on earth but the most important thing my dear sisters um is to you know teach yourself how to be that pillar of strength right we need to teach ourselves how to be that pillar of strength and one of the main ways to do that like i said is to reflect upon the vast examples that allah taala has given us of all of these strong women and you know and and just ask yourself when you face a particular situation you know what would aisha have done in this situation what if what would khadija have said in this situation and then you'll know how to act inshallah as a strong muslima bi idnillah ta'ala wa qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk